Okay. Okay, our next speaker today is uh, Rian Gijem. Dr. Rian Gijem works at the Gibraltar Botanic Gardens as a technical officer where she has held this position since 2014. Her background is in the biological sciences with an MSc in ecology, evolution and conservation from Imperial College. She was awarded a PhD in myrmecology from the University of Sheffield in 2014. Over to you, uh, Rian. Thank you. Um. Not quite yet, because they're not ready. <laughs> oh, you can have 30 seconds of the moment. And I'm going to start off the talk um, by talking a bit about the history of myrmecology on the rock, uh, myrmecology being the study of ants. And um, this was over 100 years ago, and it's kind of all where it began. And then I'm going to look at some species that we find in Gibraltar, some common species. And then we'll look at some of Gibraltar's more specialised species. Um, some species also have very interesting life histories, so we'll have a look at some of them. And then I'll end the talk talking about some invasive species and the um, effects, the uh, consequences that they can have on a native fauna. So I'm going to start with this quote by a um, famous myrmecologist, Bert Hall Dobler, and it pretty much sums up what ants are about because ants are everywhere. They are extremely dominant and they are extremely aggressive. They're the most dominant single insect group in the world. They are the premier soil turners and channelers of energy. Um, in fact, they turn over more soil than earthworms. And for example, in the Amazon rainforest, it's estimated that one third of the entire animal biomass is composed of ants. And that's roughly around 8 million individual ants per hectare of soil. Ants are the leading predators of other insects and small invertebrates. Um, for example, in South America and Central America, they are the um, principal herbivores, well, leafcutter ants are the principal herbivores, and in desert environments, um, harvester ants are the principal granivores. So they're also extremely important in uh, seed dispersal. There are 16,000 species described worldwide. Um, in terms of Europe, the most diverse area is the Mediterranean. Um, with Spain and Greece having the highest number of species so far. What exactly are ants? 
Well, they belong to the order Hymenoptera, which also include the bees, wasps, and sawflies. They form their own family, the Formicidae, and um, essentially they are wasps. They're related to wasps. They are um, wingless wasps. Well, the workers have lost the ability to fly, but flying is still retained in the sexuals, so that the females and the males. Um, ants are eusocial, so they typically form colonies comprised of a single reproductive queen, but the workers have lost the ability to reproduce. Um, they just help rear the brood and look after the queen and go out foraging. But why study ants? What's so special about them? Well, they have the most complex chemical communication out of any animal. Their social organization rivals that of humans, and they can be considered a superorganism, where the um, colony as a whole can be compared to an organism, and the individual ants are like analogs of cells. So it's impossible to dissect a higher organism into its constituent parts and then put them all back together again for study. But this can easily be achieved with ants. And they are the premier organisms for research in behavioral ecology and sociobiology because they, um, they're highly organized and they form these uh, complex societies. So I've been studying the ants of Gibraltar for 13 years now, and it all came about, it was as part of the Gibraltar Biodiversity Project, which was launched in 2004 by GONS. So far, we have um, around 700 specimens of beetles, of which over 600 of those have been identified. Um, roughly the same number of butterflies and moths have also been identified. Again, roughly 600 species of flies. And so far, I've found um, and identified 59 species of ants. And that's actually quite impressive, given the very small size of Gibraltar. In fact, this is more than the entire UK has. And then there's work in progress on the bees and wasps. So the two key players at the time, so it's, uh, it's been over 130 years since um, anybody's looked at the ants of Gibraltar. And two players were British entomologists, um, James Walker and Edward Saunders in the late um, 1880s. And some of Walker's publications include um, notes on Lepidoptera and Coleoptera of the region. And then there were two publications on the ants of Gibraltar um, produced by Saunders. And these comprised initial and important discussions of the Myrmica fauna of the region. And they were based on specimens that were collected by James Walker. So James John Walker, he was an entomologist and a marine engineer with the Royal Navy. And he was stationed in Gibraltar in October 1886, where he was in Jib for two and a half years. And he came on the HMS Grappler. He was a fellow of the Royal Entomological Society and a fellow of the Linnaean Society. And he also became editor of Entomologist Monthly magazine after his retirement. And he tended to collect insects wherever he was stationed. So he was primarily a coleopterist, so he studied beetles, and he collected mainly beetles. Um, around 1,800 species are documented in his various publications. But his particular favorites were the myrmecophila beetles, which mean ant-loving. And these are beetles which are found exclusively in the nests of certain species of ant. And in one of his publications, he makes mention to the abundance of beetle, beetles that he found. I may mention that a hundred species were not unfrequently taken in an afternoon's work. 
And on one day, I bottled 135 species, and from 30 to 40 was sometimes shaken out of a single tuft of grass. Now, this is extremely impressive, but it also goes to show that he must have been an excellent entomologist to be able to find so many species. He also collected ants. He wrote various papers on insects of the region, in particular ants' nest beetles. And uh, prior to Walker's publications, nothing had been published on the insects of Gibraltar or the surrounding area. So in uh, one of his publications on ant nest beetles in Gibraltar and Tangier, he makes reference to two very common um, species of ant where he would find um, these ant beetles. The first was Aphenogaster testaciopilosa, which today is known as Aphenogaster senilis. And the second is um, a seed harvester ant, uh, Aphenogaster barbara, but today we know this as Meso barbarus. And he actually mentions that um, it was in this seed harvester ant where he found some of his more interesting captures. So he collected within a 14-mile radius from Gibraltar. And in his publications, he men mentions that one of his favorite hunting grounds was the lower slopes of the Sierra Gabonera, which is um, the hills just north of the town of La Linea. But he also collected in the second pine wood, which we know today as Pina del Rey, the cork woods, of Al Moraima, and the furthest he traveled was the Long Stables. Now, he mentions that it took him about an hour to walk between Gibraltar and Sierra Carbonera. But he also provides some um, interesting uh, passages in one of his articles um, as to what life was like during the late 1880s. In particular, um, he provides some brilliant passages on, um, with descriptions of La Linea, which I'd like to share with you. So beyond the Spanish lines is the village of San Felipe de La Linea, which straggles over a large extent of ground and is, I may safely say, the most filthy and squalid place I have ever seen. There is, unfortunately, no way of reaching the open country except through this delightful village and even when the pedestrian has run the gauntlet of its thousand and one ev evil odors, his troubles are not yet at an end. The path for the next mile or so is along the sandy beach of the bay, which is, except under certain conditions of the tide, exceedingly fatiguing to traverse, being cut up by the hooves of innumerable beasts of burden, chiefly of the humbler sort. And um, further on in this publication, the gates of the fortress are closed for the night half, an hour after sunset, and should the entomologist unfortunately find himself the wrong side of the barrier, he would be compelled to put up with such accommodation as is to be got in the fonders of Linnea, whose insect denizens would no doubt exact ample vengeance for the slaughter of their fellow creatures during the day. I think that's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> but... Of course, Walker was not a hymenopterist, so he needed somebody to identify the ants for him. And um, Edward Saunders was the man. He was an entomologist, but um, he also specialized in coleoptera and hemiptera. And he published two papers on the ants of Gibraltar and northern Morocco, which I've mentioned. And in his latter publication, he described two species new to science, Stigmatoma emery and Monomorium andre. However, the identity and locality given for some of the specimens is questionable. Localities given are vague, and some species could have been confused with as yet undescribed ants. So, all of Walker's specimens collected from this side of the strait were labelled from Gibraltar, um, even though, as we've seen, he would often go into Spain and collect nearby. Also, concepts in ant taxonomy have changed considerably since Saunders' time. So, because of all these reasons, 
we needed to start again from scratch when cataloguing the ants of Gibraltar. So Saunders's first publication was essentially just a short note in 1888 on a collection of ants from Gibraltar and Tangier. And he lists 17 species that he identified from Gibraltar, but as we've just seen, this was also in nearby Spain. And he makes mention to um, two species that he found interesting, uh, the curious Anakitas giliani, giliani um, from Gibraltar and Tangier, and the rarer Ambliapone denticulata. But as a British entomologist, he also makes a comment on the lack of formica or myrmica. And I find this really interesting because it's exactly the same thing that I thought when I started work on the ants of Gibraltar. And this is because um, these genera are temperate and they're poorly represented in the Mediterranean. So these are the two species that Saunders made reference to. Um, Anakitas giliani here, and um, what we know today as Stigmatoma gaetulica. Both are characterized by the, uh, a set of impressive jaws, and both have restricted ranges. We're going to come and have a look at these again further on. So his second publication was more extensive in 1890, and here he lists 31 species from Gibraltar. However, only 21 of those are known from Gibraltar itself. And here he, he makes some important discoveries, and this is the paper where he provides the descriptions of the two new species to science. The first stigmatoma emery, known during the time, his time, as Ambliapone emery, and this ant was described from um, a small series of workers uh, from Tangier, um, collected by Walker. Um, Walker did not find this species uh, in Gibraltar or uh, the Spanish side of the strait. However, we do have a species here in Gib which is very similar. Um, but this species has been reported from the Spanish side of the strait by a Spanish myrmecologist, Alberto Tenaut, who, um, who noted this in his 1988 publication on the ants of the strait area. And the second species he described was, is, is a very small, yellow, quite insignificant looking ant called Monomorian Andre. Now the problem with this species is um, he, it's, it was described from Gibraltar, although we're not certain whether the type um, specimen comes from Gibraltar itself or nearby Spain, um, because we have found this species both here in Jib and in Sierra Carbonera, where it appears to be very common. Um, we know that Walker's favourite collecting site were those hills just north of La Linea, uh, so it's highly likely that uh, the types came from there and not Gibraltar itself. However, we can't be sure. So for the time being, the type locality, the exact type locality, remains unknown. So Walker's um, collection of ants are housed at the Natural History Museum in London. And we have visited the collection um, three, three occasions between 2009 and 2017. And this is to look at the collection, to try and sort out any discrepancies, uh, to try and update the taxonomy. Um, some specimens cannot be located. Um, we're having issues identifying some specimens as well. And also some do not quite match the descriptions that Saunders originally produced. And one such example is um, males of Aphenogaster. So in Saunders's publication, he uh, describes three types of Aphenogaster males that he received from Walker. The first was the ordinary um, Aphenogaster senilis from Gibraltar. And having looked at the specimens, 
uh, we are in complete agreement that yes, this is senilis, so there are no issues here. The second form that he describes from Tangier have these enormous eyes and um, large ocelli on top of the head, um, having only three teeth um, and the mandibles feeble. Uh, having looked at the specimens, these are the only ones that we can find which seem to match the description. Now, Saunders seems to think that this is the male of Aphenogaster gemella. And the third form he describes, again from Tangier, and it resembles both the above, but with um, not as large eyes. Um, having compared the specimens, I actually think that this is Aphenogaster gemella, and I've compared them to specimens that I have from Morocco and that other myrmecologists have collected as well. So it's this uh, large-eyed form which remains a curiosity. So there are two, two subspecies of gemella have been described, so we're not sure whether we're looking at the two subspecies here, but it's more likely that this is in fact a, a different species. Um, so as yet, it, it, it remains a mystery, and the specimens uh, require further study. So we're going to have a look at some common native species of ant that we find in Jib. Um, some of these you might have seen around, and you might recognize them. The first, Aphenogaster senilis, so we've just seen the males of this. Um, this is a very common ant throughout Gibraltar. It's also very common in Spain. It's an important seed disperser in the Mediterranean. They're also called gypsy ants because they have a tendency of emigrating frequently. And here you can see a worker carrying a pupa to a new nest site. This is the big-headed ant, Fedale pellidula. Um, this one will also enter houses. Um, extremely common in Gibraltar, found throughout all habitats. Um, there are two forms in a colony. Um, the, the, the smaller workers, which you can see on the left, and the large-headed forms. Now, the large-headed majors, they're not used for fighting, as one would assume, but in fact, they're deployed whenever uh, food is found, and they use their large jaws to help cut up food and transport it back to the nest. These are extremely important scavengers of dead insects, and they're always the first at the scene. So without these guys, Gibraltar would be littered in the bodies of dead cockroaches. This is Gibraltar's largest ant, Campanotus barbaricus, it is, in fact, um, one of Europe's largest species. Um, workers can be up to a centimetre long, with the queens even longer. Um, they're called carpenter ants because they have the tendency to nest in dead wood. Chromatogaster scutellaris are distinguished with, by their bright red heads, and they're arboreal. They can be seen foraging in long trails um, up trees. Uh, they will sting, and they are quite aggressive. Um, Chromatogaster aberti, they're uh, completely dark, and in contrast, they, they nest in the ground. These ants are called cocktail ants, because um, when they're disturbed, they have a habit of raising their gasters above their heads, and they also produce uh, an, an unpleasant odor. We've seen this previously. This is a seed harvester ant, Mesobarbarus. Again, quite common. Um, the majors are large and they have red heads. It's a granivorous species and it can be seen in long foraging trails, transporting seeds back to the nest where they feed their larvae on seed proteins. Um, their trails can be actually up to 30 meters long. And it's a characteristic ant of flat, sandy habitat, so it can be seen in Windmill Hill, um, also the mound at Europa, for example. Now we're going to look at some more special ants that we find in Jib. Stigmatoma gaetulicum, which I've mentioned before. This is a regional endemic, so it's found only in the uh, very northern tip of Morocco. Um, in South Iberia as well. Recently, it was found further north in Portugal. 
Um, it was, this was a species that was originally identified by Saunders as Denticulata, but actually it was a misidentification of um, Gaetulica. And it was um, Alberto Tenaut who noted this because he actually studied Saunders' specimen. It's a cryptic species and it lives underground, um, sometimes quite far down under deep set stones. So it's actually quite difficult to find. Um, their jaws contain this rows of these um, tiny teeth, uh, which they use to pierce their prey. of their own larvae. So they will pierce their larvae and suck out the juices, but without killing the larvae. And some species actually feed almost exclusively in this way. And this is called non-destructive parental cannibalism. And it's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> Another regional endemic, a Phenogaster, sorry, Anakita Skiliani, well, we've seen this one before again. Um, on this side of the strait, it has a very restricted range, um, just being found on the very southern tip of Iberia. But in um, Morocco, it seems to extend further south. Um, they have these impressive jaws, which they use to capture prey. So um, they're actually nocturnal, and they walk around with their jaws at a 180-degree angle. And at the base of their jaws, they have very sensitive hairs, which as soon as the hairs touch a prey, um, the jaws snap shut. But they can also use their jaws to bounce themselves away from danger. So like little ants springing up into the air. It's primarily a tropical genus. Um, in Europe, we only have this one species. And they form very small colonies, typically just 20 to 30 individuals. Um, in 2011, we re-described the queen of this species because the original description was incomplete and the biology of this ant was very poorly known. So um, the queens actually look like the workers, except they have um, three eyes called ocelli, um, which you can maybe make out there. Um, they're wingless as well. So um, Saunders actually described a form of Giliani with um, Ocelli, um, and he mistook this as the intermediate form, stating that Walker actually was never able to find the true queen cast. In actual fact, they did. They just didn't realize that they were looking at the queens. So in 2008, we recorded a new species to Europe, Technomyrmex vexatus. And this is a straight endemic, so it has an extremely restricted range. Um, prior to our records from Gibraltar, it was only known from Tangier and Ceuta. It was described in 1919, based on the male. It's an arboreal species. Again, um, primarily a tropical genus, um, and Vexatus is the only native species known in Europe. Um, we've never found this species in Morocco, despite looking on several occasions. So for a long time, we actually thought that its stronghold was here in Gibraltar, because it appears to be quite common in the Maquis of the Upper Rock. But last year, during a bio blitz in um, nearby Spain, organized by the Instituto de Estudias Campo Gibraltareños, we found this species for the first time. And um, we had carried out various surveys in Spain, but both by us and other myrmecologists, and no one had found it before. So um, as you can imagine, everybody was extremely excited as soon as we found it. It took us 10 years to find it, but we got there. Another species recorded as new to Europe last year was, is Temnothorax convexus. And um, we first found this ant in 2007 based on one individual from the woodland habitat of the mount. 
Um, it appears to be quite rare in jib. Um, and in 2011, a colleague of ours found it in nearby Spain. Um, it's an arboreal species uh, nesting in dead twigs um, on trees. And um, it's probably quite rare in jib because we have a lack of woodland habitat. Um, it was first described from Algeria in 1894 and then found in northern Morocco. However, prior to our records um, in, on this side of the strait, it hadn't been relocated for over 100 years. So did you know that some ants are also parasitic? So the yellow ant in the middle of the screen is the queen of Plagiolepis zeni. And this is an example of a, a workerless inquiline. And she is surrounded by her host workers, Plagiolepis pygmaea. And in ants with this um, life history, the queen will invade a host ant nest where she will find the queen, kill the queen, and take over the colony. So she, she lays her eggs and she uses the host workers to rear her brood. And this photo was taken down uh, my microscope where I had um, a live colony in the lab, which I was uh, using to observe the behavior and to rear out these parasites. Oh, I should also mention that she doesn't produce any workers. She only produces future queens and males. But there are some species that do produce parasite workers. This is Temnothorax krausi, and this is an example of a slave maker. So here on the left, this is the parasite queen, and these are the host workers, Temnothorax recedens. And here on the right, this is a parasite worker. And the workers are produced in small numbers. Um, they, they're not used to go out foraging, and they do not help rear the brood. Their only purpose is to go out and raid host ant nests, where they will go in and steal the brood, so the, the larvae and the pupae, where they bring them back into the nests, and they rear them as part of their colony. It's then those slave workers who uh, rear all the future offspring of the queen. So talk about cradle snatchers. <laughs> Some um, of Gibraltar's more peculiar looking species. This is Colobopsis truncata. It's a type of carpenter ant. And they have these strange flattened heads. Uh, the majors do, and so does the queen. Um, and they use these heads to block the entrances of their nests. They're completely arboreal, um, only found in, in, uh, high up in the trees, and they will nest in dead wood. Um, Walker didn't record this species from this side of the strait. He only found one specimen from Tangier, and it's probably because he concentrated on ground-dwelling species. Another strange-looking ant is Strumogenis. This species is Baudwiri, but we actually have three species in Jib. And they have these um, modified, strange-looking hairs on their bodies. They also have these weird structures on the waist called spongiform appendages, the function of which remains unknown. They're small species, cryptic, and they nest in the soil and leaf litter as well. They're specialized predators of columbola and other minute arthropods. Um, this is primarily a tropical and subtropical genus, uh, frequently found in rainforests. This is Gibraltar's smallest ant, Leptinilla, about one millimeter long. It's yellow and, um, well, pale yellow, transparent, completely subterranean, found living deep underground. Um, because of this, it has no eyes, so it's lost the ability to see. Um, it's the most primitive ant genus, and they have this curious way of moving through the soil. It's almost snake-like. Um, and they also predate on springtails and other small arthropods. We're not certain of the species that we have in Jib, um, because the, the 
Genesis is an actual need, dire need of revision. But these ants are probably a lot more common than we think, but they are extremely difficult to find due to their cryptic nature. Moving on to some invasive ants. So uh, not all species in Jib are native. And what exactly is an invasive? Well, it's an organism that causes ecological or economic harm in an environment where it is not native. Why are they a problem? Well, firstly, I'll just say that many accidental introductions occur. Um, it, they occur all the time. Um, Non-native species are brought in in plant material. They very rarely establish, but when they do establish, um, they can have devastating consequences. So they tend to displace native species. They outcompete them for uh, resources. They tend to be highly aggressive. They have an ability to rapidly spread. Um, they form massive colonies with thousands of individuals, and they can reproduce extremely quickly. Many species tend to have multiple queens per colony. They become household and agri agricultural pests, and they tend to be generalists. They will feed on a wide range of food, and they are able to exploit various habitats. So this is one of Gibraltar's most common invasive. It's found everywhere in Jib. Um, it will enter homes, so you may have seen this in your house. This is the longhorn crazy ant, Parachrachina longicornis, uh, named so because the antennae are extremely long, um, and it moves in a very erratic and rapid manner. It's one of the world's most invasive ants and the most broadly dispersed. So um, well, the red is uh, where it's become an outdoor pest. Um, the green region is um, where it's likely to be native. So it's probably native to India. Um, in the temperate regions, it's known only as an indoor pest. Um, but in Mediterranean, tropical, and subtropical areas, it's become an outdoor and agricultural pest. Um, it's extremely common in urban and irrigated areas, but it's by no means a recent worldwide invasive. Um, by 1900, it was already very well documented, and it probably spread along major trade routes via ships. This is another very important pest, um, one of the world's most invasive ant species. This is the Argentine ant, Linepithema humile. Um, it has spread extremely rapidly in Mediterranean, Mediterranean habitats where it's able to live outdoors. It has um, negative impacts on native ants where it's able to quickly outcompete them, but it also affects vertebrates and other invertebrates. Um, this species tends to form massive colonies um, and they will also form super colonies which um, are where you have a long stretch of interconnecting colonies which all seem to be uh, related therefore they don't really show aggression towards each other and in that manner they're able to spread a lot more quickly. Um, it's also a significant agricultural pest, and it enhances populations of hemipterans, which are types of bug. And here it can be seen um, taking honeydew from a scale insect. In Gibraltar, it's not as widespread as the crazy ant, um, but it is extremely common in certain habitats, like, for example, the mount, um, where it seems to be completely dominant. And um, here we don't see some of our more common species, like the big-headed ants. So perhaps this has um, already displaced um, some of our native ants. So it um, is native to South America, particularly Argentina, hence the name, and the surrounding countries. Um, and it's already well established in the Mediterranean parts of Europe. And it's thought to have originally arrived in Europe via Madeira, where the first record was from 1850. 
And at the time, Madeira was an important um, commerce hub between Portugal and its colonies in South uh, America. And then shortly after that, it was recorded from mainland Portugal, and then it had spread through Europe via that way. So we also run light traps at the Alameda Gardens, um, primarily to look for moths, but we do also catch flying ants. And in 2015, I came across a, a tiny male ant, um, of which I wasn't sure what it was. Um, but I knew it was an exotic, and I knew it was um, a genus that was not represented in the old world. So it turned out to be Brachymermex, um, probably Patagonicus, as this has just been um, recently found in Spain. Um, it's an extremely small species. As yet, I am unable to find a colony. So, so far I only have males and queens. Um, over the years, the number of males that we've been capturing in the light trap has increased. Um, so this year we had record numbers, and the most I caught was uh, 11,000 males from the light trap. So this is what 11,000 Brachymermex males look like. It probably came in via plant material, and so far we've only found it in the Botanic Gardens. So um, it's native to South and Central America. Um, but it has already become a well-established pest in the States. And the first record of outdoor nesting was in 2016 from Almeria in Spain. Um, interestingly, uh, it was 2015 that I first found this, so the whole year before this was recorded. So in actual fact, the range of this species in Spain is probably a lot more extensive than we think. So what does the future hold? Well, some species that we need to look out for are the, uh, this is the little fire ant, Wasmania aeropunctata. And it's been detected in Marveja in 2018, where it is already established over a six hectare area. It's native to Central and South America, but it has already become a major pest throughout Mexico, the whole of the Caribbean, and Florida. It severely reduces species diversity, it has a large impa impact on native species, but it also impacts vertebrates and other invertebrates. And it is known for its painful stings, um, despite its very small size, it's only one to two millimeters long, but it is highly aggressive. And it will attack the eyes of domestic animals, in some cases rendering them blind. Um, they're having severe problems with this species in the Galapagos. Um, it's really having an impact on their native species. And um, there are records of this ant um, eating the hatchlings of tortoises, but they will also attack the eyes and the cloaca of adult tortoises. And it's actually one of the world's worst invaders in the, the top 100. So this one is very close to home, and I'm actually quite worried about this one coming into Gerb. But another one to look for is the pharaoh ant, Monomorium pharaoensis. It's African in origin, but it's been introduced worldwide. It's found throughout Europe, and in fact, it's been well established uh, for well over 100 years. But it's curious that um, we've never found it in Gibraltar, despite being um, throughout Europe. But it's a major indoor nuisance pest, and it has particular consequences for hospitals where it will nest in. And they will feed on the wounds of patients. So this ant is so small that it will actually enter under the gauze and it will feed on the secretions, um, but it will also go into IV drips. It will enter um, sterile packets, rendering um, equipment in, in sterile. But there are also been records of this ant going into the incubators of premature babies where it will eat the lips, 
the cheeks and the eyelids, um, causing lesions. Um, there was also a report of this ant entering a patient's tracheostomy. So they spread bacteria and disease. Um, they're extremely hard to eradicate because they will nest in the tiniest of places. Um, so, Alex, if you see any small yellow ants in the hospital, please let me know. <laughs> now, just to conclude, 59 species so far from Gibraltar, but we're still counting um, because there's still work to be done on the taxonomy. There are some species where we're not certain as to their identity, and there are also some cryptic species. Um, the importance of horizon scanning for any potential new invasives. This means that um, if, we, if we know what's coming, if we know what's in Spain, then we can be more prepared. The importance of constant monitoring, and this is where the value lies in daily light trapping using our light trap, um, because in this way we are able to intercept any potential invasives, but we also can find new species to science this way and also new um, species to Europe. Well, thank you very much. And I'll just leave you with these quotes. Thank you very much, Rihanna. Very, very interesting. We have plenty of time for questions. Let me see if any have come in through. Okay, so do we have any questions from people here for Clive? All right. Well, start there, and then we come across to Charlie. Some of the, uh, the impression I got from the distribution of some of the Zants, the non-invasive ones, it appeared to me they were largely North African with outposts on the other side of the Strait. I don't know if that's true or not. But in any case, those that have distributions on both sides of the Straits, are these, is this vicarians going back to the Messinian? Uh, and if so, are there differences between the populations on either side of the Straits? And if not, what, uh, how do we account for the distribution? Um, so the ones that are found on both sides of the strait, um, they tend to be a lot more common in North Africa. So it could be this, here just could be the absolute limit. Um, some of the strait endemics that we found uh, were not recorded by Walker. So we're unsure as to how long they've been here. They probably have been here for a while. Um, as to how long, we're not sure. Um, in with regards to Anakita Skiliani, so the one with the impressive jaws, um, a recent study has shown that it might not actually be native to this side of the strait. It might just be North African in origin, um, because they, they did genetics on it. Um, but again, we can't be absolutely sure. Um, but it, it's, it's probably, what we do know is that um, Obviously, the continent was uh, joined at one stage, and the Me Mediterranean basin was quite low, so species were able to di disperse, and then the sea came in. So I think there are species that have been here um, for quite a while. Yeah, that was my yes, question. yes. But you don't, no differences. Sorry, no, no, nobody studied it, or we need to do genetics. Uh, no, no. Yeah, nobody, uh, apart nobody. from the. Um, genetic study on Anakitas, yeah. uh, no one's done any genetics. Nice thing to do, it? it would yeah, be a thanks. really good thing to do, yeah. Thanks. John? I've got a statement for you and also a question. My statement is that uh, when I was collecting uh, pieces of cork that were washed up on Rosia, Hmm. And then I started looking through them. There were colonies of ants that had been transported, obviously, from, from Spain and had arrived in Gibraltar. So this is a possible uh, way that they might have been crossing the straits as well on pieces of floating wood or, or cork. 
Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's very true. Um, we found um, a colony of Lazius grandis, which has washed up in Cork. Um, we have this species in Jib, but another species we have found which has also washed up is Camponotus lateralis. Uh, we don't have that one in Jib, um, so you're right, it's, uh, it is a possibility. Um, you know, who knows? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And my question is, uh, has there been any advances in the taxonomy of the genus Solenopsis so far? Ah, um, I think somebody's working on it, um, but because they're so small and they're quite speciose and highly cryptic, somebody needs to do genetics on them, but not just genetics. I think um, a proper study, in including... Um, the, the chemistry would be very beneficial, but it's something that would, it's going to take a number of years to do because the whole taxonomy, well, that group in particular is such a mess. Um, nobody knows what they're looking at. People assume that everything is Solenopsis fugax, which is found, or well, has been documented throughout Europe. Um, it's highly likely to be the same species throughout Europe, um, but yeah, um, a revision is desperately needed, but I think somebody is working on it. Nigel. A uh, question there. Um, uh, not a question, but um, an observation. Uh, prior to coming to Gibraltar, I was uh, stationed in, in Brazil in the Amazon for seven months, and uh, on the se in self-isolating on the 16th floor of an apartment block. And uh, one of the things you couldn't miss, although it was extremely small, was an ant that seemed to be specialized uh, in electrical installations. Mm -hmm. So it moved around the entire apartment, wherever it could find food, through the conduits that the cables ran. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, it was a problem, but not a big problem. And then one day my wife decided to buy a new computer. And within five days of her uh, using this new computer, the ants were nesting inside it. And when we left the computer in the sun, which may not have been a good idea, but the, we couldn't think of what other way to get the ants out, they came rushing out of the computer all over, carrying their larvae. That was in, within five days of purchasing the, 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 the machine. <laughs> so, you know, ants really will take over the world if we, if we let them. Yeah, no, they will. And there are actually several species which, for some reason, do like to nest in electrical appliances. Um, I don't know the reason why, but there must be a reason. Um, but it's curious, isn't it? Because they haven't evolved with electricity at all. So why they favour this as a nest site is uh, interesting, yeah. Any further questions? Yeah. Okay, thank you energy. very much, Rian. That was very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. <laughs>